Hello and welcome to today's webinar on content, kings and queens of content. Um, so this is um, the map of nuclear sites of Australia and I thought it was a really good background for this session on content. Uh, the original map was produced uh, a long time ago, um, I think even last century, um, by Scott, Scott Ludlin who then went on to be the Green Senator for Western Australia. Um, and I was very inspired by this piece of content because it visualised some really complex um, ideas um, and also some really remote places like Maralinga and Montebello, which over here in um, Western Australia is where my family lives near there. So it was, for me, a um, really influential bit of content. Um, so I went on to build Three, webs, three versions of this website. Um, and this is the third version of the poster, which is free to download, um, free to share, free to remix, um, free to use. Okay. okay, so let's get started on content. And um, first we want to uh, want to talk about what is content. So um, what I want you to do is to jump into the chat and type in there some examples of what you think content is. So I'll start off with a blog post. So if we get everyone in there um, just posting some ideas of what content is. Okay, so um, content is anything because it inspires people to join one's cause. That's right, data infographics. So just to keep things moving along, here's one I prepared earlier. Um, so in a basic concept, um, uh, content is words, photos, video, sound, anything you're publishing. So there's that definition. So here's some examples um, of what content could be, can look like. And I really want to show this just so you can get an idea of, you know, what we're looking at. So you can see that it's quite a long list and it's a little bit like, what is art? Well, you know, anything can be art if you frame it as art. And what is content? I mean, anything can be content if you frame it as content. However, we do want to be a little bit more strategic than that. Uh, and why is content and content strategy so important? Um, okay, sorry, I'll just jump forward then. So what type of content areas are relevant to you? So we've got a massive list there. Uh, for example, video games, uh, infographics, photos, eBooks. So during this webinar, we're going to start discussing like strategically what areas are relevant to you. And I really want you to start thinking um, as a system. So I'm really a big fan of systems thinking and your content for your campaign or for your um, organization should be systematized. It's a content production, distribution and management system. This is what we're building, a production, distribution and management system of content. So it's not just saying we're gonna produce some content for the website and, go to, and then go to the pub and have some beers. It's literally an ongoing system that you're continually um, producing content, uh, managing it and um, keeping that flowing. Uh, and this webinar, I'm, I've split the webinar up to two, two um, components. The second one is imagery and we'll be running through imagery on Wednesday. That's because uh, the internet, uh, a lot of our mediums are visual mediums and imageries uh this there's enough content for a whole webinar so we'll go through that on wednesday so this one um is still in context imagery as imagery is content uh however i'll specialize on that next session okay so why is content and content strategy important well it underpins everything this is all your marketing you're not running an instagram account without you know instagram content you're not running a website without website content nor Facebook page without Facebook content. Content is pretty much the bulk of what your digital communications, your digital marketing is. It's such a key important uh, aspect of digital marketing campaigning. And I think a lot of people underestimate that. They'll start doing the strategy, start building the social media, and then it starts to flatten out and starts to get a bit lame and they're sort of wondering why. And that's because they've not done the content strategy or build a content system to start feeding these, these systems that they've um, set up. It's also the key way to connect with your audience. And to me, this is the priority of digital marketing is to actually connect with your audience. So then they'll go to the next level of the pathway or um, act in a certain way or 
think in a certain way. It's also really key to drive growth. And if you've got a, a good strategy, if your digital strategy is on point, you'll see a strong correlation between how much content you can produce and how much, how much growth that you can grow. It is quite linked. Um, and that's assuming you're producing quality content and you're putting it through the right channels. However, if you, you can actually see quite a strong relationship between volume of content and the growth of your campaign. And, the, and if you're strategic with the growth of your campaign, then that's the results of your campaign. So one way of looking at it, you can say, well, if I've got all my strategy and systems in place, the more content I can produce, the more likely I'm going to succeed in my campaign. And the reason that I say that is because that different bits of content are going to resonate with different people. They're going to get shared in different ways. They're going to end up in different weird and wonderful places. And somewhere along the line, that will connect with one more person. Another piece will connect with one more person. So with the more varied and um, distributed content, then you're connecting with more and more people and growing, growing your campaign. The, another really strong concept with content marketing is most people hate advertising. Now there are a few freaky people that do, but generally everybody hates advertising. And we've become quite sophisticated with able to filter advertising out of our space. So I run ad blockers on my browser and I get really um, weirded out when I'm running a browser without ad blockers. I'm like, do people really watch this much advertising? And then I'll speak to some friends, like maybe I'm using their computer and they'll go, oh, I, I just blank it out. So their brain is able to, so this is the content I wanna see, this is the advertising that I don't, and they just blur it out. The human brain's an amazing, um, amazing tool. Now, if we're trying to get our messages through, then people are defining between quality content and advertising. So it's really important that we are then producing quality content to, to filter through all this advertising and the huge complexities of digital environments. The other uh, main point about content strategy, uh, and if you've been to my previous webinars, is I've really been doing a lot of um, discussion about strategy, digital strategy, organizational strategy. Now, if you haven't um, been to my previous webinars, then I recommend you check them out. They're free on YouTube. Uh, because what we've been talking a lot about digital strategies, building pathways for people to go from where we've never seen them before, we're connecting with them, then we're starting to build a relationship, then we're a stronger relationship, we're getting them to act, and we're moving them along the line. Um, and there's other languages of, of framing that in other ways, like for example, sales funnel is a, another way that we can frame that pathway. Content is key to all those stages of that journey. And so if you want to create a very strong uh, user journey that moves um, efficiently um, and resonates with the audience that are moving along there, you need the right content at the right times to connect with them. And uh, really uh, another interesting thing about content production is about taking control of the narrative. And you'll find big corporations do this really well, simply because they've got the muscle, the money to be able to pay for it. So for example, the mining industry of Australia has produced a narrative that Australia's economy is essential, is based on uh, mining, and that mining jobs are key employer in Australia. That's the narrative that's become mainstream, and a lot of people believe that, and that's been manufactured by constant quality content that's been um, paid and then obviously paying off Murdoch along the way. Now, if you actually break down the numbers and the Australian Institute has done some really good economic research is that the amount of jobs that the mining industry supply is actually quite small. And yes, they are a, a decent chunk of our export market, but it's not the narrative that Australia is dependent on it. And the other interesting research from the Australian Institute is that the cost per job as far as subsidies is just massive. I mean, it's such an insane use of taxpayers' money to subsidise mining jobs. Um, however, that narrative is not being told. So content plays a key role in controlling those narratives. And it's interesting how um, some not-for-profit groups such as Market Forces, um, Australian Institute, and now some of the more the mainstream groups are now starting to communicate 
on, on these facts and actually challenging that narrative. And they're doing that through content. Content is also very, can be very expensive and time consuming. So it is key that we're strategic about it. We don't want to just, um, you know, burn all of our time and money producing content because it's fun. We really want to be strategic in what content and how and why we're building it. Um, and I've also got on my run sheet uh, a link to Neil Patel. Uh, as I've been doing these um, webinars, I've been updating my research, um, updating my content to make sure it's uh, really relevant right now in 2020. Uh, and there was actually a lot of rubbish when I was um, researching content um, strategy. Now, there's just one page that I found that was um, reasonably good. So I've just had a link to that because it's good to also, as well as what I'm showing you, to actually see ways different people frame it. A different type of way for you to consume the content because that author may resonate with, with a concept that may land in your head in a, a better way that maybe mine does. And, and vice versa. So a diversity of um, training is always good. Okay, any questions along the way? And as I mentioned, the questions um, are really good um, because if you're thinking something, then maybe other people in the webinar are, are thinking it. It also allows me to um, expand on various things that you may be interested in. Okay, so that's an introduction to why I think strategy content and strategy is so important um, as part of our strategic thinking in um, digital marketing and, and digital campaigning so now i'm going to introduce content strategy so in the early strategic um, webinars i've talked about digital is a subset of your organizational strategy so you need your organizational strategy and then if you're a big org you may then have a campaign strategy so this is like what is our organization trying to do then campaign so this is specifically the campaign like we want to end logging in the old growth forest. So the strategy is how we're going to do that. And then the digital supports that campaign strategy. And now I'm going to go to even another layer and this is content strategy. And this is how the content supports the digital strategy. So we've got all this hierarchy of strategic thinking and they go down the level. So now we're getting right down into the detail of content strategy. Now that we've got all the strategies above us organized, um, but it's important to understand where they fit in, in those. Now, an introduction to content strategy is what makes you unique. Now, um, I could pull up all these numbers about how many millions of hours of YouTube gets published every day and how many blog posts and how many blah, blah, blah. The point is there's a lot of content. We're in content saturation. There's so much content, like where do we start? So if you're gonna just start producing content, um, it's gonna get lost. Now, a lot of the commercial um, marketing guides will, will advise that you just produce bland content and just start pumping it out. And the engines do actually pick that bland content up and it does go out somewhere. Um, so even producing content that's bland will work in some ways. However, what I urge you is to think, what, what can you produce or how can you frame it or what can you be that's unique? Because a lot of people will then gravitate to that and it'll be something that's fresh out there. So um, the unique approach to what I'm training is that I, I work with a lot of uh, people that aren't technically savvy or don't have experience. So I explain things uh, in a lot more simplistic way. I'll do a lot of advanced research and go to mainstream marketing conferences, all that sort of stuff. And then I'll, I'll filter that into something that's a lot easier. And then I also try to dress up and um, have a bit of fun with it as well. So I'm trying to then have a unique approach to my content rather than just having another webinar on content marketing. Um, and then obviously I'm, I'm also framing this within a not-for-profit um, genre, which most content, um, most of this content out there is for small business or large business marketing or for other marketers. So what makes you unique? Uh, the other really key thing about content is strategic communications. And again, I've done previous webinars on this, so I'm not going to go into this in detail. Please refer back to those ones. But a summary of that is that it's really important that your content has style, has personality, and you position it correctly for your audience and for your medium 
and all those things. Style, personality, positioning. It's really key um, for your content. And that is all um, strategized and you produce it in a certain way. And I'll go, I'm gonna go in a bit more detail about the how in this webinar, whereas the previous ones are the, the why and the strategic. It's really important to work out how you're gonna personally connect. As not-for-profits, we, um, we work a lot on emotions. So the forests are getting logged, um, that emotionally makes us feel really bad enough to do something about it. And we also want to emotionally connect with other people so that we can then get support to build the campaign to stop the forest. For example, um, so I just got a question here, style, personality and positioning. It's on the run sheet. Um, so it's really important, like how can we produce a personal connection with our audience? And content's key for that. So these are really important questions to be asking through the whole process from strategic through to production, through to when you're auditing and all that stuff, like how are we connecting with people? Stories are such a key part of communication. Um, and again, I've talked about this in previous webinars. Humans have been telling stories since the dawn of time and it has been the key way of passing information. And if you look at say the um, Australian Aboriginal cultures, they've, um, Oral history is one of the one major part of um, knowledge transfer. So our hu our brains are wired for story. So story is a large component of good content, content that's actually going to personally connect. So think about narratives, um, story narratives for your content, and also how you can bring a lot more storytelling. And there's a, there's you know storytelling is a whole webinar on its own. Um, so I urge you to do some research on how to be a good storyteller. Because again, there's a, there's a huge correlation between good storytelling and being effective with your end results. Uh, okay, so I've also got here fears, dreams, pain point solutions. Now this is more coming from mainstream marketing where the idea is that we wanna learn about our audience. So we wanna learn about what their, their fears are, what their pain points are, so then we can position our content to be the solution. Um, and some of the, the copy will actually, will actually define that. Go, are you feeling really stressed about this? Or are you feeling really down? And here is now the solution is this product. Even though we're not selling a product, this is still a really useful way of framing our content. Okay, so the next point, interaction and audience time. Social media is about community. It's not about just broadcasting your message out there. So it's really important when you're doing your is to when you're doing your strategy and your content production is just to humanize it. The first step is to produce quality content, but never forget that the next step is also about discussing that content online, about creating community um, interaction, engagement, sharing, that side of things. So if you've used all of your budget producing the content and you just pump it out your social media, you're really not doing the whole, whole process. That end process is really key about, um, because the content in itself may not connect somebody. It's the actual discussion where someone asks some questions about it, they're curious about it, or maybe they're skeptical and they're um, mocking you a little bit and then you can change that narrative in the discussion, then moving to the next point. So it's really key. Um, I won't be talking about that in, in this webinar, but it really needs to underline what we're doing is that how do we create a conversation? And some content is a question-based content um, or content that is designed to facilitate conversation. That's key. Okay, any questions along the way? Okay. Audience and personas. And again, in previous uh, webinars, I've gone and spoke a lot about um, character personas. So again, I'm not going to um, go through that again. So I do urge you to look at those um, webinars where we talked about character personas. However, just as a summary, what we do is we create personas um, that represent our target audience and who we're talking to. Now, once we've got those, then we need to ask the question is what content do they want? That's a key thing. Like you might go, oh, we want to produce some, some blog posts. 
Whereas your audience may be on Instagram because they just want to see pretty pictures. So in that context, it's like, well, if our audience wants pretty pictures, then how do we produce um, really quality um, visual content? Uh, your audience may be um, much more academic and prefer to read long form um, writing. So in that context, how do we produce that type of content? It's really key to make sure that you're mapping your content with what your actual audience wants. How does your, your audience consume it? What format and platforms do they want? Do they all love Facebook and just want to read off Facebook? Or do they like reading blog posts? Are they into Instagram? Um, do they prefer to watch YouTube? Or maybe they like to download eBooks. Uh, how, does, how does your audience consume your content? Or another way of looking at it, how do you create new audiences and connect with new people using different channels of distribution? So for example, podcast, people who listen to podcasts will probably be slightly different to people who read blogs or slightly different people to, to read video. So I'm just going to jump to a, um, a blog post on content for user persona, personas. And I'm just going to jump specifically down to customer avatars and this um, is similar concept to what we did in earlier um, web webinars about cu customer personas but i'm just going to jump down to sources of information here we go source of information so in this context they're talking about the individual um, persona and then they're looking at where they get the information from so in this case here's the type of books that they read here's the magazines that they read the sort of blogs that they go to conferences their gurus so they follow as influencers uh, and all that sort of stuff so this is also really important when we're doing our, con our personas is now to start um, thinking about what are the content personas so in this context with this individual this example that we're showing here if they spend time on LinkedIn, then that makes sense that LinkedIn could be one of our channels that we put out um, information. So for example, markets for um, the Strain Institute who are putting out, uh, uh, they've got quite a different audience, but one of their audience is academics, uh, journalists, so therefore journalists are a lot more on Twitter. So I'd recommend that they'd be running a Twitter profile and producing content that's obviously small by size. But for the more the academic people, which will then take on this research and then um, promote promote it in different ways, then LinkedIn is a good channel. So we're still looking at who we're targeting and what channels. And then with what channels is how do we format the content for those channels? Um, okay. And then what we want to do um, now, I've got a previous uh, webinar on um, pathways, user journeys, sales pipelines. And, and amongst that, it's really key to map content to that user journey. So the journey that we're set through to get from where we've first been introduced to them to where we're building a relationship to when we're starting to work with them and they're starting to do stuff with us needs different content along the way. So I'm going to show you two examples of that, of mapping content to the user journey. Excuse the jargon. First example um, is awareness, research, consideration and buy. So the first step of a relationship may be that if someone's become aware, so they might be aware, of, this is where you're creating awareness. So maybe they come across a post on Facebook that's, that's talking about the, the forests and they're like, oh, I. What do you mean they're still logging the forest? I thought they stopped that years ago. That's a bit dumb. So now they've just come aware, aware of it. So there's a different type, there's the type of content that um, would be sort of short form, more meme based, um, shareable, stuff that's much more from mainstream. That would be the first touch point to make them aware that, hey, they are actually still logging the forest. Then they might go, oh, I want to know more about this. So they might just start researching it. So, okay, so they're typing in like forestry and Victorian forests and logging. So at that point, then it's a different type of information they're looking for. They're not just wanting a meme that says that they're still far, they're still logging. They're looking for, maybe they want to see some maps. Maybe they want to see the extent of it. Maybe they want to start looking at some of the legals. So therefore we blog posts, um, info, um, info packs, those sort of things are starting to get more resonation. 
Now, now at this point, they go, I want to do something about it. So now they're in the consideration stage. They're considering, I, I want to do something. They're considering it. So at that point, with, um, they, with if you're an organisation that's um, working to stop logging in the Gippsland Forest, then they're considering working with you, considering donating with you, uh, maybe considering their own org or some other org. So at that point, you would want some content for that consideration. So you would then have some content that say, how do you work and how do you spend the money and make the most of the money and how can someone get involved? So it's a lot of different type of information. So they're in that consideration. Then they go to actually buy. So, and in our not-for-profit context, that is like, I'm going to come to a meeting or I'm going to come to an event or I'm going to donate. So what does a donate page look like? What is that um, final transaction content to actually get them over the line? Or how do you get them to a meeting? Um, maybe there's a whole page of how do we run our meeting? And, Da, 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 da. So the, the, those four different levels of um, engagement, different types of content um, that's important for that pathway. And so I'm now going to show you another um, example because these are all frameworks. So different frameworks can work uh, in different ways. Um, so this is another one, content marketing strategy. And again, these are mainstream examples, but it's the concept that we can apply. So on the left here, we've got, and you also see that this also correlates to the, the sales pipeline. We've got a lot bigger numbers at the start of the stage. And then as you get towards the end of the stage, the, there's less numbers. That's just the way these things work. So the first thing is attracting visitors. So blog posts, web content articles um, would be good for attracting visitors. Then the next step is you want to actually gather their contact info. So this is where we're trying to get them into the database. So with a pathways diagram that I've been showing in the previous webinars, that is a key component. So we'll get them to sign up for an e-newsletter. We'll get them to download an e-book. We'll get, get them to come along to a webinar or something like that. Um, or we may get them to sign a petition or we may get them to something like that. Then the next step of the different type of content is they're actually interacting now with the organization. So they may want to actually talk to someone on the phone or they may um, want a consultation or an assessment. So in this context, um, with a not-for-profit construct that may be coming to an event or um, talking on Facebook, having a chat about stuff, et cetera, et cetera. And then in this context, request a proposal. So this is obviously for a business consultancy, this diagram. Um, but yeah, the examples are getting them to, to go to a meeting or something like that. So that they, they, it, it, these are good illustrations to show how we're mapping different types of content to the actual pathways to get people to go through that pathways. Uh, and oh, also to this, this um, diagram is on the left that attracting visitors, that's a, that's a lot of the bulk of the content production because you, you're pumping out to get to as many people. But then when you're starting to get up the chain, this is where you're being a lot more strategic and um, spending a bit more time making sure it's right. If you're just pumping out, you know, average content um, to your main, to a big audience, that's okay because they may not resonate with that piece of content, but they may resonate with the next bit. Uh, but as you're going through that sales process or getting closer to, to where you want people to be, then they're going to be a lot more judgmental and that content needs to perform a lot better. Okay, so content management. So the whole this is quite a big subject area, so we need to manage it. And I'm gonna start with publishing hierarchies or not. So this is how you're going to actually manage the, the content because I assume that either all your content, but even if you've got a members only area, only area on your website or private content, it's still, uh, it needs some system to, to go out into the public. So we need some checks and balances because this is your brand reputation. If you pump out some content that is um, misleading, um, it, that just is telling lies, it then makes your organization look really dodgy. You, uh, somebody in your organization may publish something that's illegal. So they may be slandering, and, slandering somebody or uh, breaking the law in other ways. So in that context, um, there's a lot of legal issues to consider. So what are the gates and the boundaries to stop content going past and getting through? So I'm gonna talk about three approaches to uh, managing content. 
the first one is a hierarchical system. So this is the, the more of a traditional newspaper where you have an editor that sits at the top. So that's one person that, that gatekeeps all content. And then under that, they'll have sub editors and different various um, hierarchies so that different people are checking and, and okaying it before. And then the one final editor gets the final say. The, the content along that way is review processes. And one of those processes, if you're a big organization, would be to go through your legal team um, to make sure it's not legal. So this works um, better for more hierarchical organizations, for big organizations. Um, so the other one that I find a little bit more interesting with my community organizing is more of a consensus collective approach to managing content. So this is where we get a bunch of um, people that are working together. Maybe they're an anarchist group or um, something similar, or maybe they're a community group that just doesn't want these, these concentrations of power at the top. Um, so we, so in that context, when you've got more of a consensus way of publishing, you really need some strong guidelines and a framework. So that way people who are participating in the system know how, how the system works so that they um, are less likely to abuse that system and also to, to play with it. If they don't like certain things, then they can go through the consensus process to make changes and those sort of things. But if, if the content's in the flow, it's running a system and there is still some little bit of hierarchy in that. Um, and, but that gives the opportunity to change those hierarchies. So the system that we, we, we were using in the lab when we'll produce pumping out a lot of content because we, we were running more of an anarchist approach is that if the content was black or white, then that was pretty simple. We just trusted our people. If this was like, this is a post that's promoting Glenn's webinar. It, it's, it's a white thing. It's not controversial. It's not a problem. We trust you post it. Now, if something's grey, so that that means there's some doubts. Is this controversial? Is it like I'm not quite sure about this content? In that case, then we needed to get a second approval. So there's someone else, usually in the media team, or, or some someone else in the campaign, and they'll get a second opinion, and they'd go, "No, nah, Glenn, that's totally fine. Just put it out there." Or they go, "Oh, hmm, I, I actually don't know about that one. <laughs> Maybe I don't know." So that way, there's just some checks and balances between just just one person pumping out content. And then uh, if something was controversial, so maybe we are deliberately going to push something that's illegal or maybe something that um, is controversial in the campaign construct, then that, that then would go to a consensus process. If it's really going to um, affect the group, then it's the group that will make the decision of publishing that. So that system I found works really well in um, more of a non-hierarchical um, anarchist approach, but still gives some really good checks and balances for the brand reputation of the campaign. And another uh, method um, that's really good for if you really want to open out the control of your media systems is hashtags. Uh, Twitter use them extensively, Instagram use them extensively. Uh, so this allows, so if you've got a campaign hashtag, this allows anyone to post to it. So if you've got renegade people that are, uh, or problematic uh, people, they can still post on that hashtag and um, it's not associated with you. And it just allows that full freedom without having to control it. Um, so that, that allows um, independence of and diversity of voice. The other interesting thing is that you can also hijack other people's hashtags in that context. So when we're targeting Whitehaven Coal, who are, are logging the forest to mine it, uh, their hashtag and also the um, stock, market, stock market code is also used as hashtags. So when we're um, tweeting, we'll then use the stock market and the Whitehaven hashtag because we knew most of the people looking at this were investors. And then we'll clog their channel up with heaps of protests. So any potential investor would say, oh, this is, this is um, an issue here. Like there's, there's a protest against this particular investment. So therefore there's more risk involved with the investment. Okay. Content management guidelines. So it's really important for your media team your volunteers or you to have some guidelines about what content you're publishing and how you're publishing it and quality and all those things. So brand personality is key. And again, we went through that in previous uh, webinars, um, but it's really important that your content is in line with your brand personality, reflects your brand personality. Templates are really key. So if you're, producing a lot of um, memes, then it's really important to have meme templates. Um, what is a 
template for a newsletter look like? So that way, when you're in the um, pumping out content, you can just go, here's that template, grab that, change that bit, pump it out. Uh, the rules, it's also important to have rules around your media um, and what you're publishing. Even in a non-hierarchical environment, it's still important to have some frameworks. Like we're just not going to publish anything on our channels. So for example, Facebook works best if it's one post per day, maybe two. So we just don't want our media team just pumping out stuff on our Facebook. So we actually had rules about the, how many posts that would pump out. And that was for the best of the, um, for the whole campaign. So this is the, a, uh, it's sort of unrelated guide, but it has some of the points that I'm talking about. This is a social media guide for the frontline action on coal when we're in the lead um, state forest. And this is a guide for non-action people. So we had this guide so that volunteers could come along and jump on their Twitter and away we go. So we've got the style and voices. This is a brand personality. You know, a bit cheeky, a bit of a smart ass, um, but we don't lie. It's always facts and science. We may make a joke about it and, and be a bit smart ass, but it's always about the facts. Um, and we'll use a bit of weasel words where if, if we're talking about white heaven coal and that sort of stuff, but yeah, no conspiracy theories. We like to laugh. Um, we like to use puns. Um, so you can read this in your own time, but um, here we go. We've got the elements of a social media post. Um, this is quite important. We need a picture, um, memes, always have a hashtags. We always have a link, um, a call to action on every post. And then it's important that people don't know the campaign. So maybe this is the first time they've ever seen the campaign. This is the first post. So we want to make sure that it has a line that describes what the campaign's about so that they can, um, so it can connect with them. It's back to that emotional connection. Um, this is our first meeting and we want to assume that you don't know anything. Um, and then we've got some Twitter guides and this is a way, uh, this is also a um, framework for trolls and, comments, liking comments, those sort of things. Now, frontline action on coal on the Adani campaign, the troll um, management is just so much exponential to this. Okay, so here's a checklist of what we'll do um, during a day. Um, you know, two Facebook posts, five tweets, da, 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 da. So, um, schedules, um, some social media tips. So, uh, giving some outline. Okay, so this is um, a, a bit of a guideline, um, a templates that, that can be used. So um, it's important to produce these sort of documents, um, even for yourself, but especially if you, you're working with volunteers and stuff and that sort of stuff. And especially if people aren't savvy with strategy or content, they might not understand the, the, um, the value of good brand positioning. That's fine, they can still participate if you give them a nice guide for them to use. Okay, so now I'm going to be talking about sort of the house um, actually producing content. Because, uh, yeah, a lot of people are like, yeah, that's great. Strategy, strategy, Glenn, you keep talking about strategy. But, like, how do we actually do this? So this is what I'm going to talk about in the next, next step. So first thing we want to work out, of course, is um, budget. Like, how much time and money do we have? Now, if you're something like Frontline Action on Coal, you, you don't have any budget, but you do have um, a lot of volunteer resources. In saying that though, we're, at the time we're still running a camp and running a blockade. So we actually didn't have that much time. So still time was such a um, limit. So we needed to budget the time. So if you've um, got paid campaigners, for example, like what does their job look like in a week? How many hours, you know, you need to delegate. Um, so time for them to be able to do that to do this work to produce content so content is such a key part of your campaign and therefore you need to um actually budget it as a job that people do um never put put social media and content as an add-on it's always like here's the substantial time to do it when you're saying you had so many facebook posts a day were they just shares or they links to your own blog posts um yep yeah, they, they were our own blog posts um uh, off off time like generally at lead would run actions. So that means we're like doing a lock on or something like that. So that, that would be our post and our content. And, and the guide I showed you is for content, which is on an off day. So at that point we would be more likely sharing other people's content. Um, sometimes we might 
tell a story of, of um, you know, someone who's at the camp or, you know, something a bit more human. But yeah, generally it's other people's, um, we're sharing other people's content in that, in that environment. In saying that though, it would have been much far better to do a content plan, like I'm going to talk about in a bit, and we'd actually have a content plan for this. Um, but it's pretty, it was pretty complex working. We're literally in a tent and in a tent shed in sub-zero conditions in extreme heat running a media center with limited internet. Um, uh, computers literally freezing, that sort of stuff. Um, okay, so this can be done in your office because yeah, we have done it in extreme conditions. Um, okay, so we need to work out software. Um, you know, things like Canva cost money. Uh, if you're running Photoshop or um, maybe you're using other image editors. So you, we need to sort out software. And we'll talk about software as far as for images at the next webinar, um, but even like a word editor, all that sort of stuff. Uh, you need hardware. So for example, I'm running off a laptop, um, but if you're, you need something to be able to produce to, to work on content. Um, phones are also a great way to produce content. Um, and you'll find younger people just edit videos and produce content on phones. Um, I struggle with that. I much prefer a desktop environment. Um, in saying that though, it's still important for me to install phone software to be starting to use it because I may actually be on the street and um, I need to publish that content quick. And so I need to be able to edit it without laptops. So that's also important how phones and phone editing works in construct to content. I need the internet. That's important. So again, at the lab, we um, needed to order where we had internet because it wasn't always there. So we may say, well, we're setting up our media here. That's where the internet is. This is where the action is. How do we get the content from the action to the to the, where the internet is? And passwords. So if you're running a multiple person team and they go to post and they don't have access to a, an asset, um, they, they can't log into Twitter then they can't post to Twitter. So it's important to have a password management system. And I'll be doing a webinar on um, organizational security uh, later on in the series. Um, so be very secure with your passwords, but you do need a system where people can access um, accounts and passwords. Now I introduced the webinar talking about how content is a system and it needs to be a system. So a workflow is, um, discussing how how you produce content so it might be here we start with an idea or maybe it's a, a group of us people get together and we discuss what content we want to do then this person does some drafts then that person does the does the final bits and that person does the graphics or or whatever your workflow is in in your organization you want to document that so that people so you know how you can go from way to go with your content training is really key um, a lot of this stuff is, is not intuitive. So how to use Photoshop is very complex. Um, or Canva, I'd recommend if you're not trained in Photoshop, not to actually learn such a complex tool. But you still have to learn Canva. You may have to then learn how to use Twitter and how to use the schedulers and then how to use WordPress and how to use your password manager and all the things. So it's important not just to assume that if you're good at computers, other people are. Uh, they, 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 every single thing has its own barrier. So it's important to have training and support as a key part of your content um, production systems. Templates, I've mentioned before, it's really uh, important to have templates for a lot of stuff so you can just systemize it and speed things up. Uh, and part of that is having a style guide and assets. So by assets, I mean access to logos and fonts. So if someone's um, making a, uh, a PDF poster um, and they, ca that they can't download your logo, so they download your uh, logo off the website, it's all pixelated, makes it look really dodgy, they're trying their best, you know. So what we wanna do is we, um, we want to actually make sure it's easy for them to download the logos, download the fonts, all that sort of stuff. Uh, also, we may have, um, if you've got certain graphics that work with you, you may have some graphic styles and flourishes or um, little bits and pieces or emoticons or things that work with your design style that they can access those. They want to be able to access the color schemes and all that sort of stuff. So you want to make that really easy to access. So uh, a lot of organizations I'll start working with is I'll actually publish that to the internet. 
and I don't really care if other people access it. It's just easy for um, our people to be able to access all that stuff. It's also really great if, if you're, say, another magazine or another organisation is going to do an article on you or someone else is doing something that maybe it's an event and you're, you're invited and they want to put your logo on it, it's important to have that logo. And in logos in the different forms as well. So, you know, reversed, background, um, without a background, landscape, all that sort of stuff. Um, so your graphic designer should help you with that or find a graphic designer to help you with that if you can't do that. Also the location, where are we going to produce our content? So are we got a shared office? Um, are people working from home at the moment? Um, are we doing it on the side of the road in a ditch um, because the action's over there? That sort of stuff. So location's important as well when we're doing a bit larger scale events. So we, we may set up actually a media center for an event and I'll talk about um, that in a little bit. Um, where, yeah, where we can actually work. Um, and content management. So we need to be able to manage our content. This is internal, external. So usually when we talk about content management systems, this is usually um, say WordPress or website. But that to me is just the public content management. We also need to manage our content in, in our org. So maybe you use Google Docs or maybe you use a filing system or um, Dropbox or Sync is more an encrypted version. Where, where is your photo library? Where is examples of your previous newsletters? So if someone goes, oh, I'm, this is the first newsletter I've written for your org, can I have a look at some examples so I can get a vibe of how you write them and, how, and because you've been testing your newsletters, what, what works and what's effective? And you go, yeah, no worries, that's in our newsletter. Or actually our newsletters are in our um, CRM and here's how you access them, that sort of stuff. Uh, so it's really key that people can actually access your content to produce content because there's no point starting from scratch. If you've already got a really good image, you've already got your logo, you've already got some copy that's related from somewhere else, you can just whack together something really quick, get it up there. So yeah, it's important to set up your content management. Content production. So who is producing all this content? Um, so that's also a really key uh, thing to think about. Now, if you're a big organization with dollars, then you can just outsource it to professionals. And even if you're not a big org, you, you may um, think that there's a video that is key to your campaign. Um, and so for a, lot of, for a lot of starting out campaigns, it is really key to have an introductory video if you're sort of launching a campaign. So you put it on your homepage. So you might go, okay, so we're gonna fundraise to raise the money to produce that video. So even if you've got no money, you're a small group starting out, it's still an option maybe to outsource some stuff. Specialist staff. Again, this is more for bigger organisations. So you may actually have a media team or you may have someone in your organisation that's just good with it. Um, now, if you do have staff that are good at this stuff, then make sure you actually budget time in their day. It's not like they're doing a million and one things and then doing content as well. Okay, so you're going to produce content. And I've got a, uh, and also your brand ambassador. So by brand ambassador, generally a lot of campaigns or um, organizations will have a hero, brand ambassador, um, champion, in other words. So this is somebody who's like the public speaker or someone who does the interviews or the people that are sort of the visual leaders of the organization or the visual represent, represent, representants <laughs> of the organization. There goes my pronunciation. Um, so if, if you do have these brand ambassadors, I think it's really key that they are also running their own parallel social media. Now sports, sports people do this really well. So they'll be in a football team. Um, the football team is soliciting sponsors and advertising. So they're running their own media systems, say, say with the football. So you've got the AFL running their own media, then you've got the football teams running their own media, and then their own um, players are also running their own media because they've also got their own sponsorship deals. Now, the AFL thing that's really good because even though they're sort of competing for sponsorship, it's also just produce, they, can, they know that they're gonna connect much better with the audience than the big, big group. They're gonna build their own following. So by an individual football player building their profile, builds the profile of the, um, the actual football team, and then that building the profile of the football team builds the profile of the AFL. So that's why the, the sports, people are encouraged to run their own media 
obviously unless they're um, problematic with what they uh, are posting. But generally, um, most athletes actually have paid consultants and they don't run their social media anyway. And any switched on team would actually be mentoring and paying for um, management of their, their players' social media or their sponsors would be. So if, if Nike's sponsoring a football player, then they'd probably have their own social media manager managing their fabricated version of them. So in that context, it's exactly the same for um, not-for-profits. If you've got a brand ambassador, it's really important for them to be producing their own content, even about their own life. So even if they're just talking about going out for a bushwalk with their family, they're still connecting on a personal level with people, building that personal relationship. Um, and then that also then, then builds that connection with that individual, but then builds the connection with the organization. So I think it's essential for any major campaign that does have ambassadors or representatives to be running their own social media in support in addition to um, the main com And that also allows that the main campaign can then share and use that sort of content on, on downtimes. I'm a big fan that, um, and this is also coming from the burner community, is that everybody is a rock star. By that, um, we really want to get away from the attitude as uh, I'm just a staffer and I'm not important or uh, da, 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 da. if you have any sort of extroverts in your organization, they are the rock stars. If you have introverts, what can you do to support them to be a bit more public in, in, in what they're doing? I mean, obviously you're not going to force anyone or, or push it, but if anyone has any inclination to, um, to start producing content then do so do, do that. Um, start building their own personal um, social profiles because you'll find that a lot of people will connect with a campaign because they're friends into it or their friend works for the Wilderness Society. So I, I went to their event or I'm follow, I know about the forest because I've been following my friend that works for the Wilderness or, or whatever. So it's, it's really good to have your, to encourage your staff to be doing um, and your, to be producing content. Volunteers and supporters. So if every, most campaigns will have um, supporters and volunteers. Now within that, um, some of them would like producing content. So what we want to do is we want to spot those people. So who in our audience is producing content um, or wants to? Maybe we just invite them, do a call out to say, hey, we want people to help us with our content. Um, we're a starting org and we've got no money and da da da. So make that invitation. Now, in that context, you still need to facilitate that. If you just do a call out and then you're not actually managing or working with people, um, then that's not helpful. I've just got a question, CRM. Uh, sorry for using jargon. Yes, CRM is a customer relationship management software. Uh, and we'll be doing a whole webinar on that and our um, strategic, um, strategic, webinars earlier, we're talking using CRM as a key key point. Client relationship manager. Um, yep, yeah, so you wanna nurture your volunteers and supporters to produce content. And then also uh, I mentioned hashtags before. So make sure your campaign has um, hashtags and that you're, you're nurturing just that organic content and content production. So if you're, you're um, running an active campaign, that means on Twitter, you'll be able to see the stuff that's coming and you'll be able to share stuff. So even if you're not related to your, to a certain individuals, if they, if that produced a great photo or a good video, or that made a great commentary, you share it. And then that adds the volume to the content and, the, and someone may resonate with that individual um, that then gets then through that individual resonates with your campaign and then that all adds up. Content production, and now we're doing it. So I just wanted to also discuss some of the ways that we can talk to produce content outside of uh, the standard ways of thinking. So uh, one way to start is to actually do content brainstorming. So that's with all your, um, you, you can, if you're running a campaign or your, your campaign um, people, volunteers, staff, etc. Uh, if you're just a one person campaign, then get your friends around or your family to help you with this. And this is just to brainstorm what content you could produce. Um, stories, um, different networks, all the different bits and pieces that you may be able to produce content. So that way you can uh, really get a really big scope. And the good thing about brainstorming is that we also put out silly ideas. Um, you may, um, really have some really silly ideas for content. 
and, and then from there, you can then prioritize what is the best strategic use of your time in producing the content. Stories, and I talked about stories earlier, and stories are a key, um, a key way of communicating. And stories can actually be reasonably uh, quick and easy to produce. So for example, you can get a, a standard phone these days, you've got beautiful, um, beautiful cameras in them. Uh, microphones are okay, uh, you may get an external mic, we'll talk about that a bit in the next webinar, on a tripod and you can just sit somebody down and they can tell a story. Quick edit, bang to YouTube. So you can produce that sort of content reasonably quickly and easily and cheaply. Uh, and if that person has a, an amazing story, um, then that then will really resonate with the audience. Uh, stories about the campaign, stories about people involved in the campaign, historical aspects, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so stories are a huge base of, of to, to draw content in. And uh, what we're doing um, for Line Action on Coal at the moment is we're ta talking a lot about the stories of the people that are getting involved in nonviolent direct action because the media and the corporations have controlled the narrative about the people that are doing this sort of work are just um, unemployed doll bludgers that are punks, that et cetera, et cetera. And I've just made this narrative. And then we're all, say, talking to a lawyer, say, well, why are you involved in nonviolent direct action? Then we're having a story by a nurse and a doctor and a story by a religious leader and a story about a concerned mother. Um, and then also a story about a, a punk that's also doing it as well. So these stories can really then counter that narrative. And I think that say if it's a mother that's talking a story about why they're there doing that action, then that will have a much bigger uh, um, likelihood of uh, resonating with other mothers, for example. So that way you can really use those stories to connect with your audience in different ways. Content production bursts. Now this is uh, actually a really key concept in, um, in managing social media media production is that you're, produce, you're pumping out content every day. So it's not a matter of um, every day before you start work spending two hours producing content. That's extremely inefficient. What you'd be doing is you'd actually be producing your content in short bursts. So you might say, once a month, we're going to spend two days working full time producing content or might be one day a week or, or whatever it is. So then with, and we'll talk a bit about it a bit later as you with your content schedule and your content calendar is like, here's the content that we're producing for the next month here. And then you sit there and produce it. So if you're say doing the story videos that I've talked about, it's far more efficient to actually do multiple stories in the one day. Then you've got that all that video ready and then you can do all the editing at once. It's far more efficient. And then you can publish in the YouTube all at once and then just schedule them. So they're ready to go. You can do all the copy. So they're all ready to go because then during, it's just far more efficient and better for time. The other really important thing about that is that a lot of uh, campaigners are just busy. So therefore you'll be like, I didn't get to content today. I was just flat out doing the thing. And I didn't get to content today. I was flat out. Whereas, you know, if you've done a month's worth of content or a couple of weeks, then you know that you need to prioritize it in a couple of weeks. And as that deadline gets closer, when you're going to run out of content, that, that's much more of a priority. And then you can schedule the time in. So it's just far more efficiently able to share um, with time frames and things. So content production bursts are a really key um, approach to producing content. And then uh, one thing that I really like doing is content parties or hackathons. So this is where we um, organize an event and we um, do a call out for volunteers. You know, is anyone an artist or your copywriters, people with Photoshop, photographers, whatever. And then we come in and we just mass produce a heap of content in a short period of time. It may be a weekend or something. You may put drinks on or some entertainment, have a party afterwards and you're, you're just there pumping out content. Uh, and I'm just going to jump to an example. Um, share screen. Now, Tarkon Emotion, I'm a huge fan of. And this is uh, by the Bob Brown Foundation. And um, it's basically a bunch of, they run once a year, usually in April. And they take a bunch of artists out into the Tarkon. And they, the artists pay for their own way, but the organization, you know, facilitates the camps and, 
gets people where they need to go and connects them with activists on the ground. They also connect them with um, uh, ecologists and scientists on the ground and all that stuff. And so these people just then make art, um, musicians and filmmakers and photographers and all that stuff. They produce a truck ton of quality content. Um, and the Tarkine is such a magical, beautiful place. It's pretty hard not to be able to produce good content. So, um, but what I'm looking here with the Bob Brown Foundation is like, where is the content? This is this was number one search on Google. It's not even a picture. Like, what are you doing, Bob Brown Foundation? You have a gold mine of content. Um, really, we should be looking at the Bob Brown should be this this content publishing powerhouse that's in in competition with um, with National Geographic for quality of content. Like, anyway. Um, what are they doing with it? Um, so here's their Facebook, the actual Tarkin in motion. There's a bit, you get a bit of an idea. So there's this many artists, photographers, they involve the local um, indigenous people and, and campaigning on their issues as well. Um, so here's an example of a, a painting, um, is, uh, photo photography, et cetera, et cetera. So that is a good gold mine of, um, of content they're not using. But that example is a really good, good way to, um, produce content so if you've got something that's um that does lend itself to that type of event it's really is a gold mine for um gold mine for um producing content um we've also got here on the chat we can schedule fb posts i'll talk about that in a little bit in the future of the webinar in the future um okay yeah so content pays hackathons uh, or you may just um, also have a content working group, a bunch of volunteers, and then you may have regular times where they get together and just work on content to keep your campaign flowing. Um, so there are a few ways of sort of, you know, mass producing content in advance and then keep, keep the streams going. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about quality. Like how, quali how, how good quality should your media be? So for example, these webinars, I'm just shooting on my Mac camera. I have invested in a, um, a green screen behind me, but I'm just running. Um, I've got an extra light bulb here to make the light a bit warm, but it's pretty low tech, um, very cheap production. Um, even my microphone's not working and my adapter's in the post. However, that works fine with my brand persona. Um, if I was selling diamond rings, this wouldn't work. This would be too dodgy. So I would need to then pay for a high-end film production company to produce a really slick video. Um, so it's really key to think about um, your brand persona. Can you, like, what is the quality? So if you're um, an organization that's um, campaigning in the forests, then people aren't expecting slick video. Um, if you're making video in the forest, that's, that, that is fine. No one's going to be judging you about your quality. Now, there's a few techniques that you can do to really improve their quality without any extra money. So you should be applying those. Um, uh, so yeah, a lot, a lot of campaigns, you can actually get away with really low quality content and it's fun. It also um, depends on what platform you're using. So Instagram at the moment is pretty high end. So there's, um, there's a lot of competition. There's a lot of professional uh, image makers on there. So um, the quality of imagery to get cut through with Instagram needs to be higher. Now in saying that though, if you're building a loyal audience that's resonating with your content, if that resonation, if, if they're resonating with you on a personal emotional level and the quality doesn't matter, then that doesn't matter either. So in that, so you'll get people that maybe in your org say, oh, that quality is not good enough or, you know, we've got to do a production for content that's bigger than Ben-Hur and it's going to cost a fortune and we just couldn't do that. Well, okay, fair enough. But go lower. Like how can you mass produce content on your budget? You're not selling diamond rings. You're not selling Mercedes Benz. You're trying to emotionally connect with people and you don't need high quality content as far as production values to connect with people. You do need high quality content as far as strategic, as far as storytelling, as far as um, you know, building a narrative, those things. But that can be taught, that can be learned, and that isn't costing you money. Producing quality emotive content doesn't need to cost money. Um, 
And then I'm also going to say we can also mix up the quality depending on our sales process, on our um, sales pipeline, our pathways. So, for example, I think it's really good for a campaign to have um, a really slick video on the home page to introduce the campaign. So that's something that you may fundraise for, or maybe you can't afford it in the short term, so it's something you're going to work towards. But then you may be then just pumping out lo-fi quality stuff on Instagram. Instagram stories, for example, are also on Instagram. So people expect a bit higher quality um, images on the posts, but the stories can be really quite lo-fi and really, um, so you may be just running really lo-fi, um, do it yourself, cheap content through your stories, a little bit of quality on your Insta and your Facebook, and then something fancy on your um, homepage. So you can actually vary the qualities of your content depending on what you're using it for and where it's going. So if you're on your donate page though, you want really quality content. Um, so it's well written. So if your brand personality is as rough around the edges, so you may have a lo-fi image on your donate page, but that's strategic. Um, however, it's going to be a well-designed page. It's going to tell your story. It's going to reinforce why that person should donate. So it's still going to be a uh, high quality content. There's just maybe lo-fi. Uh, and my favorite um, image of the lad um, was these two awesome women. They dressed up in cat women costumes. They hung upside down, I'm uh, sorry, bat, bat girl costumes, and they hung upside down off a coal loader. Um, total uh, rock stars. Uh, that image was shot on, you know, those old Nokia phones, hip open phones. Um, it was an awful production as far as quality of image. It was just awful. However, it showed a picture of these these women upside down, dressed as Batman, like literally hanging out, hanging off a coal loader, stopping work. I mean, it was just an amazing image. So in that context, like the content, it resonated with me, connected with me emotionally. Um, the quality was just less important. So you mix up the quality and sometimes just like don't care about it. Um, and then other times there is time for you to actually care about the quality of what you're producing. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about SARS through some, some case studies and examples of stuff I've, I've worked on. Pine Gap is just there, right? So this is uh, the second most important military base of the US infrastructure. Um, I won't go into more detail about why, but it's also a key uh, plank um, for the nuclear weapons in, um, infrastructure of the US. Um, so we did a protest there to highlight um, what's happening and all that sort of stuff. So I'm going to run through this case study. So uh, this was very difficult in a media context because we had such diversity of people. We had hardcore anarchists um, versus um, really big organizations. We're working with Christian groups, um, um, local Aboriginal people, which have their own set of politics, um, local people. I mean, it was just crazy and diverse. So here's, um, this is a media plan, but I also want to frame it in context to a, con a, a content production and management process. So this is a collective that we um, set up and this is the systems that we use to, to run it. So we had um, what we called was the Alice Springs Media Collective, just so that we would have a very benign name. We didn't want to call it any anything that was polarizing because we wanted all the groups to work together. So the aim for this um, system was that all the people, all the groups communicate under one message and one website. And uh, that was a lot of political work, a lot of facilitation. Um, it was about a month's work, but we, we managed it and we did get all these diverse groups working under one banner. So, so we're using very um, benign words, Alice Springs Media Collective. Now under that, we, we, um, we divide that up into the traditional media. So this is more people doing press releases and sending to the radio, that sort of stuff. We had a live social media team um, so here's uh, on the left here, the organizational tools we're using. So these days we definitely wouldn't use these tools. Google Drive is connected to the intelligence community, obviously Facebook as well, um, would use different tools. But the idea is this is our content management system and here was our organizational um, discussion group. Um, and then on the right, this was the, the 
the public sites that we're running. We're running a YouTube, a Facebook, a Twitter, and our own website. And our own website was actually producing um, a lot of blog posts and all that sort of stuff. We also had a remote social media team, and this is um, something I've been experimenting a lot in these big environments, especially when it's problematic working on the ground, where we have a team that works remotely to support the people on the ground. So we may shoot uh, raw images, raw photos, they start writing the blog post, they're in a comfy office in, in Melbourne somewhere, um, they're able to edit video, they're able to help do some of that grunt work um, that is better not done on the side of a road um, under a, a dodgy tarp. Um, and then from there, we're pumping out to a journalist and a supporting organizations and then down to our media. Um, so in that context, I've got really uh, a description on how these different um, groups are. I mean, you can read this in, in your own time, but um, who, the, who the groups were and how we work. So for example, the media collective is that we meet every day to say, what are we gonna message for the day? What content, what, what is our messaging and what content are we doing for this day? Um, we set up um, two um, spaces for us to work. One of them was an actual co-working space in Alice Springs. So we actually did a, um, uh, somebody put some money up and we also had some sponsorship. So we hired a space. That means we had desks, we had internet. So we could actually work on video, work on our stuff. Uh, anyone could come in there. Um, we're also working from our camps, um, which was, was quite problematic. Uh, then our live social media team, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, and then here's the management. So we've got, here's a guide. Um, so this was actually um, printed and, and distributed. We had a media meeting at the start of the thing and, and that sort of thing. So you can see um, how we're controlling um, our system. So there must be three admins at all times. Um, and those admins are controlled by group consensus, passwords, um, or people given access. So here we go, we've got our content media guidelines, um, you know, talking about language, that sort of stuff. Um, one thing that's really important when you're doing any media is no posting while drunk or intoxicated. Um, it sounds obvious, but it's important. Also, not, also when you're really emotional as well. Like if you're having a really bad day and maybe it's not a good time to be posting um, stuff like that. Um, and here's the organizing tools and et cetera, et cetera. This was also a Twitter list that um, we, we produced. This was actually an uh, early version of it. So these are all the relative um, hashtags that we'll use for the campaign and also um, various groups. Um, this was probably ended up being 10 times as big when we were actually using it. I don't have a later copy, but we're also producing lists like this, which are um, uh, resources for people to use for media. So this is a media checklist uh, that came from the lead campaign in the state forest. Um, so there's a picture of, of us in the forest. So this is the process, like the day before the action, we would, would take certain, um, certain content. So for example, we'd take pictures of the people um, who are about to do the action because they, they would be arrested. So therefore they were unable to comment while the action's happening. So we really want to put a face to the action. So that way we can emotionally connect with, you know, this person's doing this direct action. Um, so we'd get their pictures, uh, maybe do a video with them. We definitely get some comments for it. So then while they're during, doing the action, then we can share that content. Um, I pay coordinators to do that photographers that are and would brief our photographers about certain shots that we want of the action. Um, there we go, interviewing them. We write a media release, pump that out. Um, day of the action, here's some of the things that we do during the action, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and here's some tips that we use in, in social media um, when we're posting, how we're posting, that sort of stuff. So these guides are really essential because um, the on, on the ground, these actions are usually, um, people work late to night, so very people are tired, we're exhausted, there's high stress, we've got police, um, people are breaking the law, so like there's a lot of stress and anxiety around that. Um, you know, we're in a mine, which is a lot of issues. So to um, people are just not gonna remember this stuff. They're just simply not going to be able to even 
people doing it all the time are not going to be able to be switched on with stuff. So in that case, to have very clear lists and really clear guidelines, so that when people are stressed and they're um, tired, they can then just refer to it and they can just, just tick off the boxes and do that stuff. It also means that when you do get media experts come in and consultants, then they, they can just credit. They go, oh, I just screw that bit. Like, have you thought about that? Or maybe changing that. Uh, or more importantly, if you're getting good stats and you're, um, you're, actually, um, you're actually testing what works, you can then start updating your guys to say, uh, well, we tried this, this works, or you might try that, this worked for us, and that sort of stuff. So uh, this sort of documentation, um, yes, it's time consuming, I get it, but it's just, it was just key. Um, those documents really um, increased the, um, the quality of the content that we're producing at LED. The, Close Pine Gap documentation allowed me to be able to get people to work together and then work under unified um, unified messaging, which was key for the campaign. If we had internal um, fighting and we had mixed messages coming out of the campaign, they would have just been weakened and um, ignored. Whereas by having a strong unified messaging that was, that was pumping out regularly was um, really important. Okay, so... Uh, so the next step of producing content is also to just to stop and see what content do you have. So audit your content. Um, a lot of people, organizations, mem um, and we talked about network mapping in earlier webinars. So uh, who's in your um, community? Um, who are your partners, relationships, that sort of stuff. Like these people may have content, photos, written stuff, stories, all that stuff. So you really want to order all the potential content that you have within your community, with your partners and your network map. There's also other ways to access content as well. So for example, every uh, Australian tourism uh, organization, so the state-based uh, tourist promotion, they have huge libraries of photos of tourism. So in Victoria, they'd have photos of the Great Ocean Road and the forests and all the stuff. And they allow anyone who's running a tourism business or promoting tourism in the state to have free access to that massive library of professional photographers. So if your campaign can frame, say, how you um, uh, are promoting tourism or supporting tourism. So if you're um, you know, doing a campaign in the forest, a lot of um, some forest campaigners are actually starting to run tourism side, um, side social enterprises. And the whole idea is to get people in the forest to connect, get them to emotionally connect and build the campaign. But at that point, they are now a tourism operator or promoting tourism, at which point they get access to all the professional photography of that whole area. That's one example. But if you have a look around other, um, other sources of um, content, there can be quite a lot around. And, more, and I'll also talk uh, in a lot more detail about um, imagery on Wednesday. So in this, this context, you need to build a library to start putting all your content. So start building. Um, also, if you've got a lot of people taking photos, um, yeah, you can just dump someone's 50, 100 photos into a drive and then there's, there's thousands of photos. Um, this could be something you can do, a volunteer can do, or maybe at one of the content parties is to actually just start sorting through everyone's photos and just having a best of, um, a best of folder. So when you're then running some content, you need to run some content, you can just quickly go into the best of folder. Well, oh, that's a great picture. Off we go, rather than trawling through all the photos. Now with the existing content, it's really important to think about dates. So how many have you have gone to a website and then their latest blog post is from 2016 and you're like, oh, well, is this campaign dead or like what's happening here? Um, so it's really important to make sure you're managing dates. So if things are, have a use by date, then actually you need a system to either automatically unpublish them or to manually go up and clean that mess. You should not be having a blog post from 2016 on your homepage. Um, so, or if you've got date sensitive information, so if, if there's a sort of um, thing that, that goes out of date, then, then it needs to be in context and you need to manage and plan that. Now, some content may just be timeless, like doing content strategy. So at which point I won't date, I don't need to date it. 
Now I'm still putting the date on my content because I also think that although some concepts are timeless, some stuff is also flowing um, and does get out of date. So I think the date's useful for what I'm doing. Uh, however, if it's a campaign description, you just don't put a date on it um, because if you haven't updated it and someone goes there and it's content from 2016, people don't know that. It actually doesn't matter because it's timeless content. So it's really important to think about dates, expiry, old content can be as, as bad as like whatever. Okay. Repurposing content. So this is an important concept as well. So if you're producing content, like how can you repurpose it? So I'm going to use the example of these videos that I'm producing, these webinar videos. So I'm um, so from there, it's it's um, this is actually years of content that I've refined over many years of teaching. Um, so it's actually quite dense content. So I published them to YouTube. Um, I'm publishing them to my website at the moment and to my social media. So as content, as a webinar, I'm pumping them out. They're not actually ideal for social media in its format, but that's okay. So then um, I could just take the audio and make them as a podcast. Now, I also need to put in context content optimization. So I could just make these podcasts, but then I'm also referring to examples online. So I, for me to translate to a podcast, then I may need to edit bits out or maybe just run it without the visual, or maybe I need to re-record some parts. Um, if I um, was planning this to be less visual and just me talking, then I could just bang straight to a podcast. So if I'm uh, maybe doing a story interview with somebody, then that would work fine just to get rid of the visuals, make it a podcast. And podcasts are really increasing in popularity. A lot of people um, you know, are listening to podcasts while they're cooking, driving their cars, that sort of thing. So uh, I really see there's a huge um, um, opportunity for podcasts um, especially like campaign updates or um, descriptions of campaigns, those sort of things. Um, from there, we can then get a transcribe. So I've linked to a website called rev.com. And I've just put their prices up heaps since I've looked at it, but they used to be quite cheap. But what they do is they you upload a video or a podcast and they, will, um, they get their computers to scan it. They use the AI to... Um, clean it up and then they sometimes will get a human just to tidy that. It's actually very efficient um, and heaps cheap way of doing it. So that means that I can put my video through it and then that is then converted to copy. So it's a lot quicker than me typing it out, right? So then um, that means that then I can then um, produce that straight as a web page. I can also then grab bits of that and use it as different snippets on different web pages and bits of that content um, repurposed in lots of different content ways. So I could do short blog posts, which is bits of the content. I can do short tweets, um, Facebook posts, all that sort of stuff. So the transcription of this webinar can then have a lot more reuse um, in different contexts, bite-sized stuff. So then I can then start using it more back to the pathway this, this long form webinar format's not um, very effective at getting sort of new people connected into what I'm doing, but I could then take bits of this into small, small short term format, which will then connect with people and then move them into the webinar space, which then move them along the pathway, excuse me, for that, um, that way. Then I could grab that content and refine it a lot more, put some graphic design into it, actually design it a lot more and create an ebook. That ebook, same content. Um, is now um, available thing that people can download so that I can use that to um, you know download get your email that sort of thing I can also produce what I call clickbait and you'll see a lot of this um, and I came across a not-for-profit marketing agency uh, yesterday and just everything was covered in clickbait top 10 tips to do this um, tips on that hacks cheat sheets so that sort of stuff you'll see on the internet like to 10 ways to increase your traffic and um, six ways to connect with your audience and three storytelling um, essentials, all that sort of stuff. So then I can um, refine a bit of this um, webinar into just short little things like what's the top 10 things to do for content? Um, what are the, you know, that sort of stuff. Uh, and I can also then produce infographics. So I showed an infographic earlier when I was talking about the pathways of um, co applying content to the pathways. So I can then start producing my own infographics based on this content. 
And then from there, I can distill it even more into memes, which then are much better to pump out to social media. So just this one example of the webinar, I've now gone and from, from this one webinar, produced a massive amount of diverse content that will work in different ways in different medium. So if you also think about that um, in context to your content, um, how can you repurpose it? How can you get the most bang for buck for it? Especially if you're actually spending time and money producing content like that, how can you distribute that to as many channels as possible? Okay, and one thing that I forgot to write in, in this um, a run sheet, um, which I'm now gonna add, um, is syndication. And I have talked about this in earlier webinars, but it's really important at this point. Um, so syndication is where you're uh, getting other people um, to, you're using their channels for your content. So for example, if you're writing a blog post on um, content marketing for not-for-profits and my website gets really low traffic, so I can produce the blog post and pump it through my social media and not many people are seeing it. Whereas I could find somebody who's running a, a blog post on for not-for-profits has a huge um, following and I can go to them, say, look, I'll give you this free quality content and they'll go, great. That means I can get free content that's expensive, it's free. I can sell advertising off it or whatever their business model is, great. And then instead of um, 50 people seeing my post, there are 200,000 people gonna see their post, see my post. And then at the bottom, of course, it's got a credit to me and a link back. Um, and then much more people are gonna see it. So before producing content, you also wanna look at um, how could I syndicate this or who can I syndicate it to? Uh, we mentioned podcasts, so the what um, where you're publishing your podcast to, that can be a syndication engine. Um, if you're writing blog posts, maybe consider Medium or something like that that is already promoting blog posts. Uh, yeah, so definitely looking at with your content, like who 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 could syndicate your content um, and get it to a much wider audience. Uh, so, for example, Tarkine in Motion. Um, first thing I'll do for them would be to contact all the cool, um, more young magazines. Um, uh, and not that I can say any off the top of my head. Um, things like Buzzfeed. Um, um, oh, I can't remember off the top of my head. But uh, you know, like a lot of these visual magazines and say to the journalists, come with us. Or we will we'll be your journalist. How would you like us to frame the story? So that way, if we could get um, a few of the... Um, the magazines. Now, that, the ask for them is pretty cool. It's like, oh, we're going to take you into the forest where people are blockading and it's controversial. It's gorgeous. It's where fairies live. Um, and then there's going to be a bunch of artists producing art. I mean, they'll be like, great, sure. Write us a story, we'll publish it. Um, and that way, instead of just um, going through the Bob Brown um, channels, um, which are, are reasonably big, it's then they're just going to go to a whole new audience, a whole new different thing. Now, in that context, they might say, hey, well, that's a great story, but we want you to frame it this way. Um, or maybe can we just send someone who is our audience, maybe, and I'm using a stereotype, maybe a young city person, and we'll send them and see how it works in the forest. And we can tell it from their point of view or something like that. So that way you're, um, you're still producing content, but it's actually producing content for someone else. Um, but then it's gonna to go to a much wider audience. Another example of that was um, a friend um, wrote an article for, um, is, uh, for festival culture, for Dulf culture, Psytrance culture as a magazine for that community. And my friend wrote an article about the lead um, blockade and he talked about some of the similarities between the people and the community and, and ways of thinking. And so that was really good content for that community. And then that could then resonate with a whole different community and be pumped out through a whole different channel. So yeah, definitely think about your content as not being your content um, or not being on your channels, but being on other people's channels, specifically people who have much bigger um, uh, reach than you. And don't forget the mainstream media either. either. So um, Murdoch like, loves a bit of free content. Um, he makes money out of advertising. Um, and if you can frame things in a certain way, um, you may also get um, uh, articles and journalists come on. Um, we were noticing when we were running a lot of campaign media that Murdoch Press would be simply 
quoting our tweets, they'd be reusing our images, we'd be pumping out our um, content and they'd just be using it for free. Fine, they can use, they can sell advertising, but then we're getting our campaign and messaging out there. Okay, content calendar. Okay, so this is also key. We've, we've got our strategy in place. We're starting to pump out content. Now we've got to start managing it into a time frame. So one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to get a month's worth of Instagram posts and post them on a day. Instagram works much better if you're posting one post per day. So you want to schedule which posts you're going to post, for example. So there's a few ways of doing this and a few approaches, depends on budget, how big your team is and all that sort of stuff. So the first way that you can do it is just use a simple calendar. So Google Calendar, for example, you might just simply use a calendar and you might just go, okay, on this and just create it as an event um, or a meeting. And so on, on Tuesday, we're going to post about the um, forest tour. On Wednesday, we're going to post about the ecologist. On Thursday, we're going to post about the artist. Uh, other tools that you can use um, are project management. Actually, I'll share my screen. Trello. Um, this is used for project management, but it has a drag and drop interface at the top. And a lot of people find this really useful for content management. Um, so here you go. You could have, here's the content we're doing. Um, here's, here's the content we've published. They um, have date based stuff. So there's a free version of this. Um, I'm a big fan of Asana. Um, so these are project management tools, but they also have calendars and stuff built in where you can um, manage your content. Now, the platforms themselves also have schedulers. So Facebook, TweetDeck, which is um, owned by Twitter, WordPress, you know, or whatever platform you're using, they're likely to have some sort of scheduling. Now, this is pretty primitive usually, but it'll be like, I can, I can put a post, I can put in the date that it's going to um, publish. So that, that can work well for more simple applications. Now from there, using um, just a standard calendar or using a project management software or the tools, then we've got specialist applications. And what these are is these are designed for media management. These are usually expensive. Um, however, if you're running a big campaign, it allows you to schedule stuff um, visually with teams. It also helps you with things like hashtags, what content's working, what's the best time to post. So these are sort of like the Rolls Royce of, um, of content uh, management. Um, latest uh, interesting app, um, this is, um, I started using it for Instagram and now it's expanded for other stuff. Now the free version allows me to post for a month's worth of content on Instagram. They don't allow me, for example, to put video or to put um, multiple picture posts, but I get around that as I just put the content onto my phone and then um, I schedule it on the calendar. And then when it sends me an update, if it's a video, I would just put an image. Um, the process is that it opens up on your phone, you copy the text, then it downloads the image, then it opens Instagram um, and then puts the image. So at that point when it's opening up Instagram, I just then go add my video and um, add the content where I go. So there are ways of getting uh, using that for free. Um, Sprout. This, this is like one of the, um, and I'm only just quickly going to show you some of the big guns. Um, I did some research recently and, I've, and there are cheaper ones, et cetera, et cetera, but they're generally quite expensive, but these will have like full on management systems. Um, this is really important. Some of these systems have things like analytics. So they, they allow you to track your content, what's working. Um, they also have a lot of the comments um, and interactions with the audience built in. So if you're running Facebook, Insta, Twitter, um, LinkedIn, you can actually have all the comments come into one spot, all the likes, um, you can talk and all that stuff. So if you're at a point where you can afford a full-time content manager, then at that point you can probably afford these sort of softwares. Um, Hootsuite's another one of these big ones that are doing this sort of stuff. Um, da da da. Um, Buffer is another big one. Now I'm just I I've been talking about connecting up at most webinars, but I'm just going to mention it again. Connecting up is the Australian representative TechSoup, and basically there's heaps of tech companies that provide not-for-profit licensing, either cheap or free. And um, but they don't want to manage. You know they're giving away free software. They don't want to manage then manage all these not-for-profits. So they outsource that to another group called TechSoup that then manages all the licenses on their behalf. And Australian version is connecting up.
So if you come to Connecting Up, there's um, all this cheap software. So um, you, if you're ready to pay for something, maybe have a look at through here and you may be able to find, and I need to do this myself, I need to find um, a content management system or um, a scheduler. For, uh, so a lot of these tools will allow you to schedule and automate stuff. Um, and as well as schedule the posts, you can also automate things to say, um, when I send a post, um, then if someone talks on it, I can do something. Uh, or if I, if someone clicks on a um, certain blog post, they go to a certain um, landing page that I've designed as part of the path, pathway, then maybe then I can automatically trigger a email, that sort of stuff. Let's get a lot more advanced, but um, once you start getting into that, don't forget about automation as far as your pathways. Now, when you think about calendar and planning, it's also important to have key dates. So if there's certain events for your campaign, um, Maybe there's some legislation going through Parliament. Maybe you're, you're creating events. Maybe there's a local event like an um, agricultural show that's near the Gippsland Forest. So you may then be going to the um, agricultural show and start producing content around that that's related. Or maybe you run a store at the local agricultural and then you're, you're producing content from that store. Maybe at the agricultural show, you've got a store and you're, you're collecting stories from the locals and you're saying like, what do you think about the Gippsland Forest? And you're just filming them, go, can, you, can we put you on social? And then, I mean, you could gather heaps and heaps of content just sitting there and people love being listened to. For example, what's their campaign milestones? Um, that's really important. So certain dates you might like, this is our two year anniversary from when we first set up camp and we're going to have a celebration. We're going to produce some content around that, um, et cetera, et cetera. And you also want to look at mainstream dates, obviously Easter, Christmas, all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, world environment day, blah, blah, blah. And here's something that's really key, um, for your content scheduling is, be prepared to throw your schedule out the, out the door because what is happening now, what is real time? So if something really important happens, you should respond to that quickly. Um, so for example, if there's a minister that's re related, like forestry minister, that then something happens to him that during that day, then you can start producing memes to, to just react to that. And you just, you just turn off all your scheduling or, or maybe, um, you know, one, an influential, um, doctor and she's got some comments about this and and then you can react to those comments um so i think it's important to as part of your campaign although you're scheduling and you're doing things in bulk and you're doing it more efficiently is to still keep an eye on what's happening with the media still keep an eye on what's happening and still be ready to respond fast because if you're witty or you're smart or you produce content then you've got more chance of it going big the other th interesting thing is if there's a information vacuum then your post will go viral so in that context um there was a post uh there was the when we talk about the anti-protest laws when the government was bringing those in in victoria a while ago there was no information on it and um i grabbed a photo of a friend that was getting arrested um at occupy and i quoted another friend that had a really good summary of the um any protest laws and i just whacked that and it just went boom like got shared heaps and heaps and heaps and heaps. Now that's not because I'm so awesome at content, it's just that there was, um, there was a vacuum, like there was no information about those laws and people were keen to share stuff and like to, to shoot about those laws. And so here's the only bit of content on that at the time and then it just went boom. Um, so in that case, if you're really quick and reactive to what's happening, you could be the only, um, only voice or the only content on that. And now if someone's like, Oh, I really want to react to that. I really want to express myself about something that's happening today. There's something that happened. I want to express myself. And, um, oh, here's a thing that totally it, it frames what I'm thinking. Bang, share, bang, share, bang, share. So you can get a heap of traffic, a heap of um, um, push through being very reactive and time quick. Um, and what I'm talking about time, it's really, time is really key. So when we're at the lead, we'd run an action. It was really, we would get the media out before the first cycle of the news. So we'll be doing usually actions around dawn, before dawn. Um, the morning news cycle, I think, don't, uh, from memory, is like seven o'clock or something. So this is when the, they're preparing the media for the morning news show. So then, um, so then um, we'd, we'd hit that deadline. 
uh, and then we do our, our posts during, during the day. Um, or if we're doing an event, we definitely need to get our photos up that day. Um, if you wait to the next day, it's gone cold. So um, when I was at, the, at, at Pine Gap, when I was introducing the media, I'm like, if your photos don't go through our media system on the day it happens, I don't care. You could be the world's best photographer, don't care. Um, and so what was happening is we had these lo-fi um, photographers that were pumping content during the day and that was going out. And then two weeks later, I saw this really um, high-end professional photographer that posted their photos to, to their Facebook page and they got a heap of likes from their friends and it was great. It just went nowhere. Like two weeks later, like why are you even bothering taking the photos? Like sure, it's, it's some use of the campaign or whatever, but generally you got to get that content out when it's hot. Okay, um, so the next bit, copywriting and semantic markup, I talked in detail yesterday in my Google and optimizing for Google. So um, if you go to that video, and I've got a link on the run sheet, and if you start that video at 5.53 and 30 seconds, you'll start with the semantic markup. And um, so I'll just give a quick intro now what that is. When we're copywriting, we want to seduce people to act. Um, or if we're running a campaign, we're trying to sell something, we want people to do something. So our writing needs to be short and um, to the point and emotive. We also want to suggest people to read more. So we want to put things in a format where it's really easy to digest and, and so they can read more. Um, so we have a saying, TLDR, too long, didn't read. So I've I come across a lot of articles now. Um, I'll jump to them and they're like long format. They're, I mean, it's a simple concept. Someone goes, oh, I really like this concept, a shoot to me. And then this person expects me to read this like pages of fat paragraphs. So I summarize it quicker. Summarize your information as short as possible. Um, and with the semantic markup, which is computer readable text, we are um, optimizing our text to be read by computers. So that means Google. It also means for dis dis people with disability so that they can, they're screen readers. It's also um, for now the new voice commands. So people who have like the Google devices in the um, houses that they speak to, they might go, oh, what's the update of the forestry campaign? And then Google can search for your website and then start reading. Well, the update that was posted yesterday is if you format things correctly. Um, it also future proofs your content. So um, if you're using the proper standards and the proper formats, then um, it will work on future devices that have not yet been um, designed. So that's a very quick snapshot because I've already gone through it on the Google search. So please check that video out and, and I'll go in a lot more detail about formatting copy um, for search engines, but then also for um, emotion, emotive and getting people to read it a lot easier. And then I'm going to uh, finish off with data um, because an important thing about everything that we're doing is asking the question, is this working? So if you've done all the things and you're producing great content, but then it's just not working, then you need to start working out why. You need to say, well, maybe we need to change our point. Maybe uh, it's the wrong content for the wrong format. Maybe it's the wrong content for the wrong audience. I mean, you need to ask those questions so that you can start deconstructing and making sure that the efforts you're spending on your content is actually resonating and hitting home. So tracking is reasonably easy on the internet. Um, and again, I went through um, tracking in previous um, webinars um, about, you know, you can use Facebook um, analytics, Google analytics. Um, most of your um, apps will track what's working, what's not, how many likes, how many feet, how many um, views, how many clicks, that sort of stuff. So you want to start tracking that response and then seeing what sort of content works for your audience and what sort of content's not working for your audience. Uh, another thing you can also do is what we call A-B testing. So this is where we do one version of the content or three versions. We test it and see which one works the best. So if you've got high traffic, um, there's plugins for WordPress or for other um, website software. There is also um, Facebook ads do this by default. Google ads do this by default. Um, so that you can, what they'll do is you put in three versions, they test it really quickly and then they'll pump out the one that works. Um, and another way of seeing that sometimes on Instagram, you might scroll down a photo and it's actually 
been fast forwarded to the third one, maybe in a, in a group of photos. That's because Instagram's like, people have been fast forwarding to that one and we know that's the good photo. Uh, if you've got low traffic or um, ways of testing, there are other ways of testing. So for example, when we were in lead, we used to um, just pump out a heap of memes on Twitter. And then the one that got the most traction, then we'd post it on the Facebook. So there's a few ways of testing there. And then the, the final thing to talk about is the cost of acquisition or the cost of your goal. So if your goal is to get um, somebody to um, join your campaign and it's taken this much content to get someone to join and it costs this much, like you really want to start analyzing how much it's costing to get people to like to, to achieve your goals. And by cost, I mean time, money, that sort of stuff. So you might be finding out it's super expensive to be producing your content to get someone to achieve the goal. And then maybe um, content marketing is, is, is not working for you. So you might say, well, maybe there are other ways to do it um, or et cetera, et cetera. Or again, is it the right content for the right platform for the right audience, that sort of stuff. Um, so, um, and if you're um, really efficient with your, your cost per acquisition and you're, you can prove that you're producing this much content and getting this much results, then you could then go, you could then go to a funder and go, look, we've done this with 500 bucks a month and two volunteers. If you give us $50,000, I can get you these stats. And the response goes, yeah, that sounds great. Let's do that. Um, so cost acquisition per goal is not necessarily just so that to show that you're you're um, not wasting money it can actually be a really good fundraising tool um, I've shared your course oh thank you for sharing the course that's really um, that's really um, appreciative that you're sharing um, so I'm giving away these webinars for free um, and there is a lot of years of refining for this content. Um, my primary goal is to get activists more skilled because we've got, you know, a lot of work to do to fix the world. Um, so that's my primary goal. Um, but it's also really good for promotion um, and I really do appreciate donations which help me to pay my rent as I'm building these things. Um, so yeah, if you, if a donation is not appropriate to you, then yeah, please share my stuff on your networks. Please like my stuff on social media and comment. Um, because as you know, um, if we're commenting on posts, then it actually increases the algorithm and increases the reach. So thank you very much.